<laughs> hey everybody, it's Chris again, and it's the Small Business Safari. And today I'm going to be going without my co-host, Alan. So I'm going to be riding solo, but I feel like I'm in pretty good company because I have Jason Sleeman with me. And Jason, uh, I had a good opportunity of meeting him a number of years ago, and I've been able to follow him and what he's been doing. So I'm thrilled to have him on. And But before we introduce him and get going, and just to give everybody a little bit of heads up, we always like to cheers before we start. And Jason is the financier of Craft Breweries. So... Cheers. Jason, thanks for coming on, buddy. Yeah. Cheers, Chris. Um, thanks for having me. All right. I took my first swig. So, Jason, I could probably not do you justice telling everybody who you are and where you came from. So why don't you tell everybody a little bit about who you are, kind of where you came from, and then we'll start diving into the cool stuff you're doing now. Yeah. So, so now I um, head up the Craft Beverage Lending Division for United Community Bank. I am a, start, you can see by the gray in my beard, I'm a 20 year plus banker. And so I, uh, I tell people that I've seen the good and the bad of, of all banking. I saw when money market rates were five and 6%. And now, um, you know, I've seen a couple of crashes and uh, it's, been, it's been very interesting. So I started out on the uh, consumer side of the bank. So I actually uh, led to kind of the banking centers, both in the traditional brick and mortar banking center and uh, I've actually done some of the in-store. So when you see those banks in like a Kroger, uh, I actually led, led one of those for a while. Uh, and about uh, 15 years ago, I came over on the commercial side and started working, uh, you know, just with general businesses. So, uh, you know, from, from small mom and pops, uh, I think I did a loan for a, a guy who was doing a trailer for a car wash, you know, all the way up to 10 and $15 million loans. So, you know, I've kind of run the gamut across that and I realized about seven years ago that I really, really liked the people uh, in the craft beverage industry and really liked how they uh, run their business and how they, you know, responded to, you know, suggestions on, you know, making their business more profitable and uh, just kind of working through it. So found, found a love for that uh, and then just uh, never looked back and, and said, this is going to be the, the group and people I want to work with. Well, you stole my thunder because one of my questions um, for, for those who listen know that uh, I was in banking for a number of years on the consulting side and building it up and, and uh, doing some really commercial loan operations. I never really was a lender, as it were. But one of my my, my, my biggest questions always is, you got to tell me the, the funniest thing you actually were able to get a loan for, get it collateralized. What was the security? Come on, what was one of the best ones? But you said one of them, but I just got to hear a couple yeah. more. Um, a couple more that were, were interesting. Um, you know, I've done, I've done a lot. I mean, like, you know, on the personal side, I've done a lot of, uh, glorified yard tractors. So like not, not necessarily like the big ones, but just like the, the, the kind of medium sized yard tractors for, for people, uh, you know, that, that are, you know, they're not quite a, the thousand dollar ones, but the five and $6,000 ones I did, I did some of those. Uh, and then, you know, on the, on the other side of it, there's there's a lot of funky stuff that you finance on the on the brewing side. And, you know, some of that is from from yeast to uh, to fermenters to uh, you know different types of canning lines uh, to to bottles. I, I will tell you one of the funniest things that I financed was um, a set of bottles. So someone was contract brewing, uh, not contract brewing, they were distilling, and they needed help on the bottles. And so we financed a bunch of fresh fruit. And, uh, you know, curvy bottles was uh, something that we had done for uh, a customer. And so that was kind of a weird one to, to do, because if that loan had gone bad, we would have owned some fruit and some bottles. And so we were crossing our fingers. that didn't go Yeah, bad. I could only imagine the conversation you had when you went back to your credit officers and said, hey, man, this is what we're going to do. All right, I'm going to give this guy some money. And here's what we got. I got fresh fruit and some really cool bottles. And the guy's <laughs> looking at you like, dude, what are those things worth? You got to be kidding me. No, no, no. We can get this done. I could just see that meeting going down. I'm sure, I'm sure it went a lot better than that. <laughs> yeah, I pro- I, if I had phrased it like that, we probably wouldn't have done it. But exactly, uh, it was. It's it's <laughs> one where uh, it was an emerging brand, and they were doing pretty well, and so it was a little bit uh, focused on the success they were having and what they were going to have, and a lot less of us wanting to own a bunch of bottles. So clearly, you uh, you'd gone to college, uh, came out with a finance degree. In, was banking where you wanted to go? Was that or is that something you said? Well, I don't know. Uh, I can't be a pro football player, so I got to be a banker. I don't know. What'd you do? 
Yeah, so um, I, I happened to fall into banking and it was because I uh, started sales. So my very first job out of college, I actually worked for a company that sold adhesive paper. Uh, and so I tell people I kind of really did work in the, uh, the real life office. Uh, there was a bunch of knuckleheads and, and myself and uh, I was actually calling on people on the West Coast and I made a huge sale. Uh, and I'm sure you can imagine being fresh out of college, I wasn't making very much. So I went to my boss and said, hey, I made this big sale and uh, transparently it paid for my salary for like 15 years. And I said, we should do something about that. And he says, we can talk uh, in a year when we when you come up for a review. And I said, mm, that's probably not going to work for me. So I went and found the wonderful world of commission. And I think like a lot of other bankers, for a little while, I was a mortgage loan officer um, in kind of a unique time like this. It was, it was uh, right around September 11th um, when I was there. So kind of interesting timing from, uh, you know, what, what people were focusing on and, and things like that. And so I, I um, figured out commission and the, the hard world of commission only uh, and said, okay, but you get paid what you kill and uh, you, you go out and you're hustling. And so I uh, did that uh, through a couple of transitions. I ended up with a group that was uh, part of a bank mortgage group uh, and then worked my way into the traditional banking from bank mortgage. Yeah, your background is, uh, it was very interesting. I'm glad you brought up uh, the part about going to that commission-based stuff. When you think about entrepreneurship and you think about making that leap into, you know, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to start my own business, man. It is scary as hell, right? You're, I'm sitting there, for, you know, I was freaking out when I did it, but I had already established myself and had money. And so I had a lot to lose uh, to do it. You're starting out in the beginning. And that's one of the things I tell a lot of people is, man, when you're first starting out, I mean, what do you got to lose, right? You can always go bounce back and try something else, but you had to do something that a lot of people are afraid to do. And you had to bet on yourself. You went hundred percent commission and did that. Were you in a bigger size organization or was it pretty small still at the time when you were doing mortgage loans that way? So uh, when I was doing it, it was a much smaller, it was, I would call it a broker, right? So it was kind of one of those where you had a bunch of banks that you were lending the money for. Um, there was about 15 of us. So it's still pretty small. Um, and no one checked to see when I was coming in and no one checked to see when I left. But if I didn't do what I needed to do, uh, they knew because the payroll didn't run with my name on it. Yeah. So you, you've always had that kind of entrepreneurial bent about you. You can always, you can tell already and that you had that bet on yourself. So you're doing the mortgage loans. And then eventually you started getting into the commercial loans and started that work uh, to get there. What did you find more interesting there? Was it, was it uh, because mortgage loans, it's more like a transaction. You got to get through there and do volume and then the commercial a little bit, a little bit less volume, I, I would assume. And, uh, but you had to go out there and really help people figure out their businesses. Uh, which one did you find more interesting or were you, or did you go, hey, man, mortgage loans, they paid the bills. I'll go back there. Yeah, so mortgage loans were interesting because you do a lot more of that at someone's kitchen table. So they'd invite you into their house and you, you would sit over there and talk about loan options and draw those, those things up. So it's really interesting. Um, I don't know if that's how it's done now, uh, but at the time, that's how you do it. You, you'd talk to someone and they'd say, yeah, come see me at 7.30 p.m. on Monday. And you'd go to their house at night and sit over their table and talk about it. Um, the commercial side is very interesting. I mean, I had a, a conversation today where someone had talked with a big bank and they basically told them, hey, what you're doing is not really, um, they, they weren't thrilled with kind of some of their historic stuff. And I spent an hour talking to them and saying, hey, look, here's how we look at it. Here's some of the things you can do. Here's how you can prep your loan to be best for us. And we really kind of talked to them about having a COVID narrative about their business. So, you know, where they, um, didn't have the sales that they may have wanted the last two years. It was very, uh, you know, they could really kind of point to, here's why we didn't hit some of these numbers. Here's why we didn't have some of these kind of things. So for me, you know, the, the, the um, going into being invited into people's house created one aspect of trust, but being able to provide the advice to help someone get the funding they need to grow their business, it, you know, also creates a different level of trust. So, you know, I think where I am now, uh, the commercial uh, side of it is good for me. I um, tell people that bankers hours died long ago. Uh, you know, there's a lot of times where I'm sitting at my desk at seven o'clock in the morning. And a lot of times I'm sitting at my desk at 10 or 11 o'clock at night too, trying to get deals done. So, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's fun to do the commercial side because you really are, you know, with a residential mortgage, you're helping impact one person. Uh, when you're funding a business, you're helping potentially 40, 50, a hundred families uh, by ensuring that they can grow and continue to have success. Dave, you brought up a couple of great points for everybody. That's uh, 
one, you love the personal interaction, you know, sitting across that kitchen table, of course, today in the world of mortgage loans, especially in homes, that's not, that's just not going to happen because it's so automated at this point, you can pretty much figure out the credit rating and go that way and figure out what the debt to income ratio is and all that stuff. But on the commercial side, then you get to go over there, but you're impacting 50 to 100 people's lives. Man, that's really cool. You get to do that. And some of the best bankers I've ever met didn't feel like they were just there to get the dollar. What didn't feel like they were just going to get the loan. They felt like they were really helping a company grow and become more successful. So I, I love how you do that. So you, you've been in a couple of verticals, but now you're in that craft banking world. And, and I know that's what everybody wants to hear a little bit more about, because especially if you listen to this podcast, you know, we like to drink and we like to drink beer and I'm drinking one as we're talking now. So did you decide to get into that market and say, man, that's the vertical I'm going to go and I'm going to go really try to blow this out? Did somebody tell you, hey, this is the opportunity, Jason, you got to go grab it? So it's uh, neither of those, actually. Uh, the, the craziest part, of it, I, I fell into it. Um, we had a senior banker on our team who was banking a relatively large company and this uh, customer's son basically wanted to start a brewery. So the senior banker came to me and said, I, I don't know what to do with this. Here's this other young guy. You're a young guy. Figure it out. And that was the, uh, the direction I got. It was kind of that pat on the head and a smack on the back and sit me out of there to, to go do it. And so um, initially talked to the guy and I said, how much do you need? He said, I think I need this amount. And I said, okay. And so we were kind of going along and I got a call about halfway through. He said, hey, I got good news and bad news. I said, okay. Good news is we're halfway done with the project. I said, okay. The bad news is we've spent all the money that we had assigned. We need more money. I said, okay. How much more do you need? And he says, I think we need the same amount that we got the first time. So went back, convinced the bank to do it because no bank wants to have a halfway done deal. Uh, and so we gave him some more money. And so that very first one was very successful. Um, that was in a kind of a different time in the Georgia market, right? It was, you know, you, the breweries couldn't sell beer directly to consumers. You had to build these really big breweries with lots of equipment. Um, and so we went through that very first one and I learned a lot. And so when, um, I asked him, I said, who else do you know? I, and he said, well, I know this guy started a brewery. So I went to that guy and said, hey, I just did this brewery. Let me see if I can do yours. I said, by the way, I know more now this time than I did before. And so I finished that one and I knew twice as much. And so I asked him, I said, what do we do with that? And so, you know, it just kind of had this snowball effect. And then eventually my phone started ringing. Um, at this point, I still wasn't specialized. I was, you know, doing just, I was a general commercial banker. And then my phone started ringing with breweries. And so um, at that, at about that time, you know, I was like, okay, well, this is pretty good. And so I got this kind of, you know, good pipeline full of, of breweries and realized there was a lot of value because, you know, most of the time they're first generation entrepreneurs, brewery owners are not, you know, they, they for the most time, you know, their parents were entrepreneurs. Um, they, they're leaving kind of a, a W-2 job of some kind. Um, you know, for a while, they weren't even in the industry. They were making a industry switch to try and do it. You're seeing a lot more people who are in the brewing industry or distilling industry start their own stuff. So you're seeing a little bit more industry expertise now, but it was a big leap of faith. And so one of the value adds that I had was after doing 30 or 40 of them, I could say, hey, when they came and said, we need this, I said, no, I bet you need this. I think you need double this and you need this and you need to add that. And so, you know, we got to it where it was really streamlined and we weren't having to go back to the well multiple times. We were doing it, we were finishing projects on time and on budget. Uh, and so that was that was a really big part of it. And so um, I actually got in the position I'm in, in the dead middle of COVID. Um, so kind of one of the toughest time for the craft beverage industry. And I just knew that, um, you know, getting the specialized in, getting the specialized across the country was really important because, um, you know, for the next, that, in that time and going forward, you know, having the industry expertise is going to be very valuable to ensuring the success of these uh, breweries and distilleries and wineries. Wow. Yeah. What a, what a great thing uh, you brought up so many things. I'm going to have to go back now. So let's go back to this one. This is the one uh, very interesting. I think uh, we all want to know more about this and that it, you got a first generation entrepreneur, no track record of success, has a beer that he thinks tastes all right, or she thinks tastes all right. Say, hey, man, I'm going to go do this. I got no experience. I got a little bit of money behind me. What are you looking for in the character? What are you looking for in the credit profile? What, what, what are you looking for? You know, tell us, tell us the secret sauce. Yeah. So it's evolved now, right? So, you know, and, and I can, you know, 
kind of talk about the Georgia brewing industry because I think, you know, for, for me, that's where, you know, I'm in Georgia. That's where my first love started. You know, if you roll back to 2018, the industry wouldn't allow you to actually uh, even sell beer directly to the consumer. So because of that, there weren't very many breweries. There's only about 30 breweries in the state. And so getting industry experience was almost uh, unheard of. Uh, you know, now in Georgia, there's 130 breweries. Um, you know, nationwide, there's over 9,000. And so you're seeing a lot more people now that aren't necessarily jumping directly from home brewing to opening. They're maybe going from home brewing to saying, okay, I want to work front of house, or I want to work as a sellerman, or I want to work as a brewer, you know, and, and kind of learn the industry. And then they're being able to take it. So, we, I mean, we still see a lot of home brewers starting. Um, there's less of that for a couple of reasons. Um, it's become very expensive right now. Um, you know this, uh, you know, supply chain and construction costs have gotten out of control. Um, we, we could talk an hour about the projects that either didn't get done or um, when they did get done, they were two and three times what they were expected to have from a budget, uh, especially when, you know, price was going up 40, 50% at a time. Uh, so, so, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot more people with industry expertise you're seeing a lot more people who are kind of taking a um, wait and see approach and saying, hey, look, um, you know, we, we talk about, you know, I think that COVID shifted a lot of the brewery focus. Um, you know, there are still breweries that want to have cans everywhere. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about why cans everywhere is not actually that great for a brewery. Um, but, you know, a lot more have suggested that they want to own their neighborhood and own their market. And so we were seeing you know, three and four and five million dollar projects become 300, 400, 500 thousand dollar projects. So a little less risk for the entrepreneur, a little bit more laser focus on your market um, has been really the key to that. So, um, you know, if, if you ever talk to a brewer, you, you know that that industry is not one known to be making people rich. Um, and so you talked about the character and capacity. And so, um, you know, the character is going to be really important to kind of understand what, what does that person do? Do they understand the industry? One of the one of the you know early indicators that I know someone doesn't understand the industry is when I get a set of projections and they're the same every um, time, right? There's no um, seasonality in their projections, so I know that they don't actually know the industry that well, right? If I get one that has seasonality, I say, okay, this may be a home brewer, but they kind of have done their their homework and research. Um, so kind of understanding that, um, you know, the startups are the most risky, so we want to see the best credit profile there, right? You no. Know, no 500, 600 kind of credit. We want someone, you know, who, who knows they can handle their, their personal aspect of it. And then really, you know, it, it, this hasn't changed much is, you know, the, you need investors uh, for the most part. There's not a lot of projects where they are not going out and convincing an investor um, to be part of their project. Um, and that may be, you know, smaller, uh, you know, it may be looking for industry expertise and selling off some of the business uh, to have some industry expertise. Sometimes it's going out and raising capital. So someone may have all the industry expertise, you know, but they don't have the hundred or two hundred thousand dollars they need to pair for the million dollar loan. And so they're going out and finding somebody who has the cash. So you know, there, there's there's a lot to be said, and you know, I, there's uh, you know, not no two breweries are the same, uh, but you can start looking at them, and you're starting to see the trends, and the trends are definitely they're smaller, they're more nimble. You know, COVID kind of um, helped to teach to not be super leveraged. Uh, and so there's still a lot of, you know, in any industry, there's a lot of leveraged businesses out there, but you're starting to see the newer ones become a little less leveraged and have a little bit more equity put into it. Yeah. The gold nugget for me there was, uh, and this isn't almost every business, you, you got to niches, bring the riches, man. You got to niche yeah. down. You got to get in there. You're not going to compete with Bud. You're not going to compete with Miller Light in that world. And if you're in a business, you're, you're not going to compete with the big dogs. you got to make yourself unique and find your unique pitch and your laser focus. You also hit on another thing that I, I hope everybody picks up uh, because you, you said, it. you know, I'm looking for the character of the person. The character means, did he go in there, dig in there? And I'm going to say he, you're not trying to be sexist. I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm all for women empowerment. I got a daughter who's kicking it out of the park, loving it. Uh, but let's get back to this for a sec is, uh, do they really understand what they're about to get into? Because it's a big leap. And you just said, it. you're not going to become a millionaire just because you got some beer you think tastes good. You've got to have a plan. You got to know your financial projections. You got to know the aspects of the business. So that's what you're looking for. You just say, I want an informed 
person. And then I need to make sure that they have the money behind them, the investors behind them, or the, the, the money raise has to be done. So you're not going out there tasting the beer going, Hey man, this stuff tastes really good. Yeah. I'm going to give you that loan. You're out there looking at all the business aspects of does the finance look straight? Does the person really understand it? Can he withstand what it's going to take to build this uh, up and get going to establish his market? But he's got to have that laser like focus. And that I love that. It's so good. But that being said, do you actually ever taste the beer before and say, okay, or man, this does taste like a dog's ass and there's no way this is going to sell. Uh, so I have, uh, you know, transparently, and I think anybody who tells you that it's not, it would lie to you, right? But there have been times where I've been out and I've tasted beer and I'm like, well, I'm probably not going to call them now, right? Like that's, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not calling them to give them money. Um, but I do, I try, you know, especially if they're established, um, you know, I'll try and go visit or figure out how I can get my hands on something that sometimes proves difficult uh, if they're halfway across the country to, to get my hands on something. Uh, but, you know, with the way distribution is picked up and, uh, you know, every, if, if they're in distribution, they want to be in every state. And so you'd be surprised that in Georgia somewhere, um, you can't find a beer from California or New York or something like that. Or, or, you know, you may know somebody who's in that area and you call them and say, what do you think about this beer? And they may, and they're usually even more brutally honest. They'll say, oh, that beer is terrible. Or, you know, that brewery is a dump or, you know, you don't, you don't, that's, there's there some reputational risk from there. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting to, you know, get, get the story. I mean, with social media now, like you, you can have it. So they'll be, you know, very brutally honest and they will sometimes, you know, tell you if there's reputational risk or, you know, local things that they know about. Uh, so that's really helpful. Um, you know, the ratings aren't always good, um, you know, it, but, you know, pe people are, the great part about the industry and where we are in social media is you can find a lot about a brewery. You can find a lot about a brewery owner um, and you can find a lot about their beer just by being online and, and knowing someone in the area. Yeah, that's cool. So now I got to disclose what I'm doing for those that listen to the podcast. I am actually drinking a Bell's Lager of the Lakes Bohemian Pilsner. Bell's is out of Michigan. I happen to live in Georgia as well. Couldn't get Jason to drive on over to the studio with us but uh but i did get this beer from michigan i did that because my brother lives in the same state and is in the same city and happened to know the guys uh who were invested in bells so i'm like hey man yeah i'm gonna get some of that stuff so that's what i did uh so your interest you, you actually said something that i wanted to dig into a little bit more is it is the as you look at your market and looking at your target market you said you know own your neighborhood earlier but is that one of the is that one of two ways they do this business model then is to try to own their local neighborhood, or then they also try to tap into distribution channels. I talk a little bit about the differences and how you do that. Yeah. So here's, here's what I would tell you for our, the, the cans that you see on the shelf. They're kind of like a Ferrari, right? They look really good. They make the brewery look really big, but it's super expensive, right? So when you, when you roll up to a Ferrari, you're, you're paying for that, that reputation. And that's the same thing for the cans. Um, it's the most expensive beer they can sell uh, with the least margin that they're going to make. Um, so it is, if you're going to be a big distribution, you, you think of like the really big, big breweries. Um, they're out there just pushing volume. You, you have to have volume. And so those are the guys that you see doing, you know, 1,000 barrels, 2,000 barrels, 3,000 barrels, 10,000 barrels, 50,000 barrels, 100,000 barrels. The, there's, you know, the other model is be really small and own your neighborhood and maybe only do 100 or 200 or 300 barrels, uh, but it's much higher margin. So when you think about it, I always tell people the, the best way to think about it, no one's going to look at this beer the same on the shelf now, is when you look at that, you know, uh, $12 or six pack, the brewery is really only going to make about three or $4 off of that. And they've got again <clears throat> hold that all right Wait. go ahead 
So on those, you know, 12 packs, they're making their least amount of margin. If you think about that one that's owning their own neighborhood, they are going to sell you a, a five or six or seven or eight dollar pint. And on that, they're going to make like a 85 or 90 percent margin. So, you know, the same reason you they want you to see the cans is because they want you to do what you did or your brother did, which is go to the brewery probably and buy that beer and have a pint and have things like that. So they, they need um, just as much you know, people to visit the breweries as they do to have them buy it on the, on the shelf. They still want you to buy it out there in the market, uh, but where they're making their money is on you being uh, a butt in the seat uh, and drinking a draft beer on site at their brewery. So uh, you now, I guess I'm not going to have to go into this thing, and that's about the marketing and branding strategy that they have to put together that you're looking at to help them go with. Are you looking for that mixed branding strategy where they are going to do some cans out there and and some advertising and and what do you see and what do you what do you see has been effective for these guys to get their name out there and, and drive people to their brewery to get the 85 percent margins? It's uh, so I would tell you right now it's very hard. Like if you walk it. You know, go into any liquor store, any grocery store, anything like that, and just look at the beer aisle or especially the craft beer section. And it is overwhelming for a consumer, right? So yeah. you, it's almost a twofold kind of looping among itself. It's I need you to have a really positive experience at the tasting room to start building some brand affinity and brand loyalty. And then I want you to go back home and you, because if you live 40 or 50 minutes from the brewery, I want you to pick up on that Friday night. I want you to pick up that six pack. But then I want you to think, oh, you know, I really love that brewery. Let me go back, right? So it's kind of this loop that I need you to get into to think about my, my beer all the time. And so I would tell you that if someone just came to me right now with a really, really large distribution play, um, I would think it would be, uh, it'd be very hard for them right now. Like it, just because it's very crowded, you're fortunately not seeing a lot of uh, projects like that. Uh, but when you are seeing, um, you know, some of those projects, you know, if they're, if they're a 50 or hundred barrel brew house, you know, it's a, it's a pretty tough market to break into right now. So, you know, you're, you're want, what I'm wanting to see is if someone's really going to try and go full speed in distribution, you know, they're already owning their corner and they this is their extension of brand. So they've got people um, that are in other places that want to, um, you know, build from that. I mean, you, one of the things, if you watch the news and you're watching craft beer, you're not really seeing people build these big distribution you know, you're starting to see them build multiple tap rooms, right? Because if I can bring a tap room, if, if you know, if, if thinking about it, if I'm in downtown Atlanta and I can bring one to the northern suburbs and I just saved an hour. Okay. So, so what you'll see is you'll start seeing them go north, south, east, and west. And so what they're doing is they're being able to move more and more high volume stuff and then a lot of times what you'll see is they'll build kind of a centralized production facility where they're not even distributing to other places. They're just distributing to themselves. So, you know, some of these bigger guys now are starting to build um, big distribution centers to just distribute it to their brands across multiple states and in multiple locations within the states. Wow. So they're building out. Uh, so I've got a tap room, um, you know, XYZ brand. And for those who are in Georgia, probably won't know one, but um, if you want to promote one of your favorite ones or perhaps a prospect, you let me know and we'll pump that one in there. But XYZ has a tap room and they want to do this and they're going to go. So they go find and identify another market to go build into. And so they're building another place there and doing the same thing where people come in, we get good margins, and then they get to serve their beer in that tap room. How, how many uh, have you seen do this? And when they do it, is it two? Is it three? Do they kind of tap out to use the pun? <laughs> let me do it. Uh, at three, I mean, what kind of, what are they doing? Yeah. So, so, um, you know, in full disclosure, that's not a client of mine, uh, but Monday night brewing is, is a good example right now. They've got an, they're kind of their original, um, in, in one part of downtown Atlanta, they've got kind of a specialty area and another part of Atlanta. They're now in Birmingham, Nashville, and they just announced that they're going to Charlotte. So they, they're about to have their fifth location. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, when you look at, um, brands like that, you know, they, they can continue to expand, um, you know, and, and continue to grow. So I, you know, I don't know where the max is going to be, um, you know, because eventually it gets hard if you put, you know, 50 of them, 
it's hard to kind of manage that, but you know, right. You yeah. Cause then, then you're in a whole different model. You're, it's, you're not a brewer anymore. You're, you're a, there's a, the brewer, the manufacturer, but now you're in front of the house. You're, you're definitely running retail in certain environments. Yeah. So Monday night brewing, if you're listening to this one, perhaps you need some financing, perhaps you need a guys in the market. Uh, Jason's your dude, man. That's what I'm thinking. I don't know. So, uh, have you ever done any work? Now I'm going to start throwing names out. I was actually kind of waiting because Alan's going to join us in the second half of this uh, interview. But I got to ask now, so have you ever done any work with Gate City Brewing? So I know them very well, but I've not done any work with Gate City. Okay. Yeah, because we uh, we had a guest on who uh, lived over there. And so we ended up uh, not doing a podcast, but we just went over there and hung out and had some beers one night with him after. And uh, we did it at Gate City Brewing in downtown Roswell here in the suburbs of Georgia. Uh, fun time. So getting back to the... Um, the brewery market, obviously there's a lot of different models uh, that you can do. And that's what obviously makes it interesting to me, to you. You said 150 brewers uh, and breweries in it, in the Georgia market today, 900 in the U S 9,000. Oh, I'm sorry. 9,000. Oh, even better. Holy cow. So are you starting to tap that? Uh, ah, did it again. I'm loving my puns, by the way. Um, I've got plenty of them coming. Don't worry about it. So are you starting to see you're doing more lending outside of Georgia? Or are you still staying right here with these 900 in here and working that market? Yeah. So I, right now I'm doing a lot more outside of Georgia. Um, you know, Georgia, I think has hit kind of a little bit of a, a plateau on some of the bigger projects, but we're seeing a lot more smaller projects. Um, but some of them are so small, you know, that they don't even really need financing to do them. They're just super, super small. So um doing a lot more in, in, you know, some of the surrounding states. So, you know, North Carolina, Florida, um, you know, even kind of in the, in the Midwest, there's a lot going on right now. So um, we're, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot. Um, but for me right now, it's a lot more national than it is, you know, just local to Georgia. Ah, interesting. So they're doing that and I'm, uh, I'm blowing my, uh, I'm blowing my boy out here uh, who just joined us in the studio. We'll let him get on screen here in a minute, but not not yet because I'm still the talent baby. But as you as you're working with these guys doing this, are you seeing it still expanding? Have you seen it kind of mature out um, as as a market as an industry, um, or do you still think it's an emerging market? Wild West, everybody's going to keep rolling. Ah, he paused on me. Damn it. So um, you know, it's interesting because I was asked that same question uh, recently about you know the growth. And I think depending on the way the model goes, you know, because I even pose this to some of the other people that I think, and some people say there's this infinite upswing. Um, I think we hit maybe 11,000, 11,500, uh, and then we start seeing some natural um, acquisitions and mergers within. So not like the big guys buying them out, but, you know, if you own a brewery and I own a brewery, we combine forces and say, okay, we'll, you know, rebrand or we'll do whatever and we'll pick up a little bit more um you know partnership so kind of being able to focus more on that high margin beer for sure so you're seeing that uh start to peak out that's that's good stuff so for those listening to the podcast as you know i like to uh do every episode with alan but alan was running a little late today and we had to keep doing this so i went ahead and took care of the first half but we dragged alan in kicking and screaming to talk about beer and drinking so Jason, I'm going to introduce you to Alan. Hey, Jason. So we yeah, said cheers. I, like I said, I'm sorry I'm late, but I brought beer. And uh, just for anybody listening, I've been dealing with a 93-year-old father who was um, sent to the hospital and his car was impounded because he was driving impaired. And basically, it was because of the levitating babies in the back seat. So... Uh, it's been a heck of a couple of days. That's what we'd like to call altered reality. I wish, yeah, I know. I've been altering my reality every night. <laughs> dealing oh, with this. man. <laughs> I just wish I knew what you talked about because I just love talking about beer and well, breweries. I'm going to get you up on that and because you just, just walked in and uh, Jason's new potential client, Monday Night Brewing, we just got done talking about their business model and what they're doing. Jason doesn't know that we're plugging the hell out of them, and I'm actually going to tag them. It's because you're going to suck up for a uh, endorsement sponsorship. Of course, endorsement sponsorship and do his work for beer. Cheers. I, I've done it before. Well, and he doesn't know I come from the state of Oregon, where I think, you know, it was one of the birthplaces of the craft brewing movement. 
And I'd love to talk about saturation because we were just back in Bend, Oregon, which is a town of about 80,000 people. I think the Metro is 120,000 and they have 22 breweries and the beer culture there is fantastic. All right. So Jason, can you put that myth to bed? Tell me, tell me Oregon did not invent the craft brewery business. I said it was one of the, I know you said, you know, pioneers. I know. Uh, So I don't know where craft beer originally came from. It definitely wasn't Georgia. Um, it's still not good though, uh, from where it is. So all, all the three of us that are sitting here now are not in the, uh, you know, the, the home run spot for craft beer, uh, you know, overall. Uh, but I will tell you that the West Coast seems to be uh, doing it pretty well right now, um, you know, in, in some aspects and in, in some of the, um, I'm going to use a word I don't like, hype breweries uh, are still out that way, right? So like, you know, we're, we're talking about some that, may not have been super successful, but we're really happy like modern times, um, you know, where they had a pool in their brewery, uh, you know, is, is kind of that West coast style. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely kind of a, uh, an, an industry of its own when you get out, uh, to that West coast. Yeah. Well, obviously I know it's a good place. That's what I just, uh, I hate that he came walking in with his Oregon duck shirt on. Because they're about to get just absolutely just <laughs> pounded by the dogs. Oh, there we, we, we may not even have a conference by the time they play. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, what's next for the craft brewing market? Is, is it acquisitions? Is it mergers? Is that is that where you see it going? Because you just mentioned that you're kind of at the top, going to saturate. Is that the next round where you come in and help people? Yeah. So, so I don't. I mean, I, I think we're still. Uh, this is my personal opinion, and who knows if it's right or wrong. I, you know, I still think we're a ways from saturation, right? Like. Going back to Georgia, you know, right now Georgia's got you know two breweries per capita, right? Like when you start looking at that, we we can we got lots to go, right? And I and I always tell people like I'm a good example is if you look at my house, um, you can go 15, you can pretty much go infinitely due north, and there's no brewery there until you hit like the Tennessee line. But if you go east, west, or south, it's probably 15 or 20 minutes for me to actually get somewhere, right? So like if you put one near my house, you don't really have much competition. Well. I, I still think there's a lot, you know, going back earlier to we talked about, like, if you're not worried about distributing and having cans on every shelf, uh, and you're really worried about just selling some good high quality margin beer, um, you know, we, we could have a lot more, right? I, I think, personally, I think Georgia could double, maybe even triple in their size of, of breweries and, and still be fine, right? I, I mean, it, depending on if we're doing kind of small local taproom stuff, if everyone was trying to be on the shelves of, you know, uh, your local liquor store and filling the place up, um, we're, we're not in a good spot for that. But if we keep just kind of owning our corners, there's a lot. But I do think, um, personally, I think, you know, we're, we're still seeing a lot of expansions. We're funding a lot of expansions. We're still funding some strategic startups. Uh, but I do think we'll start seeing some acquisitions. Um, you're starting to see some breweries uh, that are listed for sale, you know, and people trying to either buy that spot or, or buy the brand. So because it's been around, you're starting to see that second generation. As we talked about at the beginning, a lot of the people you funded in the beginning, first generation entrepreneurs, maybe coming out of a W-2, got an idea, uh, make sure that they have been working either in front of the house or working distribution, had some knowledge and experience. Are you seeing some of those people look, start to look for that exit now? Yeah, so you're starting to see it like, you know, you talk about Bells. Bells, their founder retired after 36 years, right? So, you know, kind of... Uh, an interesting opportunity. So you, you are seeing some of the uh, the uh, the granddaddies of craft beer. They're they're starting to exit out, and you're starting to see um, you know those being either passed out. It, it's very interesting. I've talked to a couple of breweries where they're doing like ESOPs, um, which is not something you normally think of in the brewing industry. You're starting to see a lot of um, you know employee owned, member owned kind of breweries that are starting to birth, and that's the exit plan for some of these founders. Is they you know had a really good you know, team. Uh, and they said, instead of selling to someone else, they'll just sell uh, to the to the employees. That is such a big point, because a lot of times as we jump in as a, into business, we're like, all right, man, I'm gonna make that big leap. I'm gonna go make it happen. But I'm not thinking about leaving. I'm just thinking about starting. Because for a lot of us who start our business, uh, well, nine out of 10 of us, uh, our exit strategy is to fail, go down, boom, dead. But we don't think about trying to figure out how to get out of it. And a lot of us start to figure it out a little bit too late. So uh, what, and, uh, and I'm one of them, by the way. So I've been learning uh, as well. The easiest way to sell your business is to the people who are in the business. 
The hardest way to do it is to go outside of your business, market it, put it together, put together your pro forma, show everybody that you're not running everything through your business. <clears throat> uh, did I say that on here? Mm -hmm. Shit. Um, uh, IRS, I do not run anything through my business, all legitimate business expenses things. Thank you. Was the Spain trip on business? That was it. That was, um, that was a board meeting in Spain. Was, was, was Cabo another board meeting? Uh, well, that was me talking to potential investors. And How about Daytona strategy. at the pit? That was uh, me talking to an expansion. Vegas. Uh, that one, <laughs> ooh, damn it. Uh, that one, uh, that was a conference. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, I got a, so He's just all rattling legit. off. He's he's just rattling off a couple of the vacations I went on this year, just a couple in the last couple months. And that's probably true. So <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. All right, we got to get back. So the exit strategy, the ESOP, go and do that. So you're starting to see these people starting to turn them over. Uh, so is it an opportunity for people to get into this business? Is, do you think it's the good one? Because you actually said something right off the bat. This is not a place where you get rich. This is a place where you have some fun and have some, and maybe make a few bucks. Yeah, I mean. It, Look, there, there's plenty of profit to be made in a brewery if it's run right and run like a business. Um, you know, not too long ago, it was more of a, there were a lot of people who got in as a hobby business. And you had a lot of investors who thought that, hey, I'll invest in this brewery and I'll drink for free. That really is not a good model for anybody. Um, but, you know, there, there is, there is um, you know, money to be made, um, you know, understanding the right thing. And sometimes it's a long-term play. There, there are um, you know, definitely some brewery owners that I know that were couch surfing for a while but before they kind of got up and said, okay, I can pay myself some, some money. You know, personally, um, I wouldn't get into the brewing industry, but that's only because I don't know how to brew beer. And I think that if you're an owner of a company, you should be able to know how to do your product. Uh, and the good news about that is we're starting to see a lot more people that's the way. Um, and that is one way to kind of squeeze some margin out is to not have to go out and hire everybody. Because at one point in time, we were seeing it where someone would come in and they'd have to hire out every position and there goes most of your margin. So, you know, being able to be smart about things, um, being able to, you know, understand why you do something and how you make money um, is important. So I, I will tell you, there are more breweries making money than there are that are not. Um, but if you do it wrong, you can definitely easily be in that category of not making money. All right. So this crap brewery whole thing. Um, I've been waiting for Alan. When he said it, he said, hey, man, I can make it for the second half. I'm like, great, because I want to ask this question. So uh, is this kind of like television where, you know, when television first came out, everybody's like, nah, this ain't going to last. This ain't radio. This is a fad. It's gone. Are, are craft breweries a fad? Are they going to be gone? Or will they evolve and always have a market? Or do you, where, where do you see it going? So I think there will be trends within the industry that will come and go. Seltzer is one of those. Um, Seltzer has had a had a meteoric rise, and everyone was making a seltzer, right? So, like, you couldn't go to they may not have all came them and packaged them, but every brewery for a while had a seltzer. Um, that has seemed like a huge cliff that has fallen off, fallen off. And I think that at some point in time, the novelty will wear off. I think um, the same thing with sours. Oh, let's not talk about sours. Oh That's one of my favorite types of beers. Jeez, sorry. <laughs> well, hey, for those of us who don't know what the hell that is, what is it? Go ahead. So, there, so there's a couple of different versions of it, um, and there's different ways to do it. Uh, but sour, like a true sour, um, is infecting the beer where it has it starts getting a funky taste uh, and has a different sour. There are different types of brands like Berliners, um, which they would like fruit and they would do things like that. Um, technically, there's something called a Goza. Um, which is like a sea salt coriander. It's kind of got a tangy taste to it, um, you know, and so there's varying degrees of how sour things get. Um, and then there's ones where they taste like, you know, drinking a sweet tart, right? And like they make your mouth pucker in and you, you add, you know, different things to those. So um, I'm not saying that's all you should drink. I'm a fan of a huge clean lager or Pilsner or Kolsch, um, you know, and, and being able to, to drink some beer flavored beer. But I do think that there's going to still be a, a great margin and great uh, demand for, you know, the funky stuff. Wow. So that's why I think that's what I heard. So TV, I guess it's here to stay. That's craft breweries. But within the craft brewery industry, there's going to be ups and downs. Uh, there's going to be that cloudy IPA. There's going to be that triple hopped IPA. There's going to be that IPA, IPA. What is that, by the way? What I mean, India Pale Ale. I mean, just completely, you know the, it's just so hopped up. You do, I mean, all I get is hops. Do you know the history of it? No. 
So from what I understand, it was brewed for the British troops in India, low alcohol, high hop beer, which would be very thirst quenching. Huh. Did Jason, did you know that? I've heard of some story similar to that. All right. Well, hey, come on now. If you're going to be my banker, bro, you got to know these kind of stories. You gotta well, bring some yeah. value for me, big boy. <laughs> All right, so, so are, you, are you ready? Are you ready for a story? So, the, uh, oh yeah, Chris, you're familiar with Jekyll Brewing. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, so if you look on all their logos, you will find 44, and that has to go with the fact that if you know the the drinking water was not originally uh, safe to drink down in Jekyll Island, and so they purified the water by boiling it and effectively making beer, and so everyone got 44 gallons of clean drinking water which was actually 44 gallons of beer is what everyone got when they came to Jekyll Island. And so that's actually um, Mike over there. That's the, the story. And that's why they use 44 and that's where they do that. So, you know, that a lot of beer, you know, the preservation and barreling of beer and things like that had to actually do with preserving a capable, um, you know, drink uh, as opposed to the actual properties of having beer, right? Because they boil it, it they, they clean it, they do these kind of things. Um, you know, that's very, it's, it's very, you know, it, it, that, that's where some of it is. And now I'm about to get down a rabbit hole. And, you know, one of the things- That's a that rabbit hole that I find very interesting. I was just in Belgium this last year. Oh, really? Oh, look who's on vacation all the time now, big boy. Yeah, it was just <laughs> one vacation in the last five years. But, uh, you know, they've got basically two kinds of beer from their history. And one was, and they're both from the monks, and there were two philosophies and one was to do a high alcohol beer to replace wine because for the sacraments because the uh, supply from france wasn't very consistent and then there were the other monks who were just trying to brew a, a low alcohol beer that would be safer than the drinking water in the area huh yeah so it's you know two different motivations there i like it i'll drink both of them well, we knew that already, I guess, didn't we? All right, Jason, you did redeem yourself with that story. You're still my uh, you're still my banker to the brewers. But so we, got, we do got to come up with a tagline for Jason, though. I think banker to the brewers. I've been trying to think of this thing. We, well, we to need the, to talk to Andy, our last guest, and you can give well, him a brand. We are. We're going to give him a brand. We got to yeah. give him a. We got to give him a tag. Wonder, wonder what color LinkedIn. is appropriate for breweries. You know. Yeah, we have to ask him because well, we learned like red is bad for hospitals, right? But it's good for you. It is good for me because it's a call to action. It's get you motivated. I still think it represents blood, but but not blood on my fingers as we're out there working on your house. So when when you know, and I know you guys talked about this before I came. That that's what I'm afraid of is asking the question that's already been asked. I'll cut it. All right. Cut. When, when does somebody when does somebody come to you? So for example, I'm in commercial real estate, and believe it or not, we were actually doing a deal on a piece of property that contained a brewery. So I was extra engaged. We had to do a lot of site visits just to kind of make sure. And in the, in the um, kind of to your point in certain directions, there aren't any breweries and we actually identified a town and we actually have a location and it's like, we need to put a brewery there. So, you know, we probably could find investors, but um, one of the people we were talking to, they know a brewer who would be interested. We can probably pull off the property. I mean, is that a scenario that you would go, yeah, that sounds like fun. Let's, let's talk. Or are you more the, you know, like the uh, Monday night guys or six bridges up in Johns Creek. It was uh, people who just were home brewing and decided to scale it up. Are those the people that come to you? Yeah, so a, a bunch of a bunch of answers over here, right? So one of the first things that we've seen is we are now seeing that breweries are becoming the anchor of new live work play, right? So all these exactly. people who want to build a project, they always want a brewery in it, right? They come and say, we want this brewery. And so, you know, finding that is really important. So um, Matt, here, are you ready for the next hour of the show? No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> you know, people are having to identify what they want to be, right? So we earlier talked about canning and doing that kind of stuff. Well, if you're in the bottom of an apartment complex, you're not a canning brewery, right? Because it, it's not set up to do that. You're more in the industrial area. So you're, again, kind of going back to some of these like hub and spoke models, what you're seeing um, is you're seeing someone has a big production facility, but then they're in the bottom. I mean, Reformation is a good example of that, right? In Smyrna, they're in the first floor of a, uh, a building, right? And so, um, you know, those, those are kind of some of the things you're seeing. And so, you're seeing people come to me in a couple different ways. Uh, just like you, 
said, I, I've had people who have come, who've been in economic development or a, a town or a mayor and said, hey, we want a brewery. Who do you know that would be a good fit for this, right? That's one way that they get identified. Um, we still get people who are starting a brewery from scratch. They're, they're you know, they've been a, they haven't been around. They may have been a home brewer. They may have been a um, professional brewer, uh, but have not, you know, necessarily had leadership, you know, and they, they want to go out on their own. Um, but traditionally, people find me and, and want to talk to us in one of two ways. Either they're starting for the first time and they're putting their inaugural kind of um, place together, or they're expanding. Uh, and so we get a lot of discussion about, hey, we want to do an expansion in place, right? So we're in a five barrel system and we would go to a 10 barrel system or we need these additional fermenters. Or someone who says, hey, look, we've got, we're starting to kind of own our corner. And we want to go find someone else's corner to own too. And so they, you know, add a second or third location. So we, we, we get people throughout the process, um, you know, from, from startup to expansion to full maturity. So uh, Alan brought something up uh, that in your answer. That was really cool. You're right. If you're sitting at the bottom floor of a live work play, uh, they're not going canning. They're not going to go distribution because overhead's too much. These are the guys who want to go multiple places. But you said something else that was really cool, and this is where uh, a good banker, and I, and I know you are, is the person who connects people, is the person who gets out there and networks. You said, I got a call from a mayor saying, who do you know is a good banker? So I mean, I'm sorry, a good brewer. So you're actually getting calls from people that have met you saying, hey, Jason, um, we're thinking about doing something in, in this, uh, this place. W who do you recommend? That's, that's awesome, man. So uh, this is what, no matter where your industry is, I know most of your listeners are not going to be brewers, but finding somebody who, um, you know, is investing in your business just as much as you are is important. So I, I, you know, people ask me all the time, what makes me different? And I first tell them that my money is just as green as any other banks. Um, but, you know, when I look at it, um, you know, I had, um, I was at a technical brewing conference and someone was talking about hops and hop variety and what the new cool hops are going to be. And I actually texted some of our brewers like, hey, you should be watching out for this hop because it matches your profile of your beer. Um, and then that same week, I put two brewers together to brew a collaboration. I had one moving into it. Like they say, hey, we want to we want to move into another city. Who do you know? And so I connected them with a couple of different breweries, um, you know, like the, the head of that uh, Brewers Association there. And so for me, you know, I, like, yes, I want to do loans for a lot of people. But just as importantly, I want to make sure that my clients are getting everything they need to be successful. Right. So if if I can help give them a leg up on this super cool hop that no one else knows about, you know, and it makes their beer more desirable, I definitely want to do that. I'm going to let Alan have the final question. Yeah, you know, I, you mentioned collaboration, and it's more of a, it's not a question, it's a statement. It's one of the things I love about cra the craft brewing industry is how collaborative it is. And we're all, we're business guys, Chris, and, you know, normally it's just scorched earth and we want to just destroy our competition. And yeah, yeah exactly. He's given the double finger, double birds. No, I love and, my competition no, no, when they're it, dead under no. my wheels. And it's amazing in craft brewing. <laughs> they, they are so collaborative and somebody could open down the street and they help each other. And if something goes wrong or, Hey, can you come take a look at this? I can't figure it out. It's amazing how they work together because it, I guess in their mind, a rising tide floats all boats. And if, if everybody's making a good beer, then more people are going to enjoy craft beer. And whether it's in my place or your place, is that what you're seeing out there? Yeah, so from, from an outside observer, a lot of times people will say, well, why do all these breweries want to be together, right? We'll, 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 we'll get out of Georgia for a minute and we'll talk about Asheville, right? So there's 50 breweries in this very, very tight, small, you know, mountain town in North Carolina, right? And part of the reason that's so exciting is because people will go there as a destination, right? And so if you can, if you're one brewery sitting on an island, you're a stop. If you're two breweries on an island, maybe you're an afternoon. If you put 50 breweries around, you're a week-long trip, right? And so people will come and they will um, build their week around going there. And so you can literally go and say, I'm going to go to this brewery here and then this one and then this one and this one. And usually, like the last time I went to Asheville, I came home with a bunch of beer that it still hasn't been consumed because I'm like, well, I don't know when the next time I'll be here. So why don't I take some beer to go? And, and so, you know, it's just a it's a huge game to be able to, to kind of build these pockets where, you know, breweries are there and, and you get 50 unique opportunities. Right. So not everyone's brewing the same beer. They may have same styles, 
but they'll have their own little funk that makes them a little different. Um, and that and that really kind of draws the consumer to these pockets of uh, beers. Uh, and the collaborations are a big way that they get that done is um, they, you know, hey, these two breweries come together and they'll sell that beer in each other's tap room and then it helps cross pollinate the clientele. Wow. Yeah, actually, I, I, I'm in full support of that. I think that's true. Well, and another kind of an interesting parallel to that is uh, when they had the big fires in California and then to raise support, they uh, they came up with a recipe and it just went out to all these craft breweries and they were brewing a beer. And so it'd be one item that they had on their menu. And then the proceeds from the sales of that beer went to relief of all the people that lost their homes in Northern California. I mean, I, I just love the the brewing industry and it's just a really interesting to think about a uh, thing to think about in business. Um, I mean, there's some parallels like car dealers don't want to be by themselves. They want to be in, in right. pods, but the brewers actually work together for the benefit of all. And it's, I don't know, man, it's I kind of a that. kumbaya kind of thing. Yeah. That's making me, I'm actually I'm I starting get... to squirm in my seat. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it's good. I, I agree with you. You know, because there's enough to go around. There's enough good business. You don't have to uh, extinguish somebody else's flame to make your own. Uh, that, was, that was a hard thing for me to get used to because yeah. I just love destroying my competition. Right. I know. Well, I still do. Yeah. But I tried to go kumbaya <laughs> with you. Like so, uh, Jason, I know we're coming to the end of our time. We got to let you go as well. Uh, so before we let you kind of plug everything in that, we've always got three questions we love asking people. And so I got to ask my standard questions because... I'm in the business of working on people's houses. That's Creature Comforts from Athens Brewery. Uh, no, uh, yeah. Creature Comforts. Yeah, for, from uh, yeah, Creature Athens. Comforts. It's a uh, Tropicalia. Perfect. So they'll be sponsored. It's soon. what Thor drinks. Thank you. Okay. All right. What is the favorite feature of your house, Jason? It better be a tap. No, it's it's not. Uh, so I think it's the place that I spend the most time. Uh, is my basement office. So I'm uh, in my basement office a lot. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I've got a bunch of uh, pictures and things that uh, are just are awesome, right? And I've got this really awesome lazy boy over in the corner. And so, you know, if I just need a nap, I'll just, uh, you know, nap for a little while. So, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely my uh, home office in my basement. Here's what I just took away. Lazy boy in my office. And that's exactly what I need because right now, for me to steal my power nap, as I call them. Because you uh, need a break between all those vacations. You I do. You know. Well, I'm still jet lagged from coming back from Spain, man. Oh so I, I crawled under my desk, <laughs> closed the door, turned off the lights. It's just not, I'm getting my lazy boy. All right, lazy boy, number one. Second thing is when you go out there and you're out there in the world and we're all about customer service and trying to make things happen. We do it at the Trusted Toolbox. Alan does it in his business of commercial real estate. What is one of your biggest customer service pet peeves? So the number one thing I try to avoid is be is just saying no. Um, I have to say no sometimes. I like that answer. When I say no, though, I want to say I'm a no. Here is an alternative, and so I try and give them a couple of options. And I will a lot of times make introductions to other people who can help finance. I can't finance every deal. Um, some deals are too small. Some deals are just a little too funky. Uh, but I built a, a group of people that I can refer to, so I don't have to say just no. Good luck. I can say no, and let me help you find the yes. It's not a no. It's here's what I can do. I like it. Yeah. Oh, that gold nugget for Alan. Yeah. Bringing it. That's right. Bringing it from Monday Night Brewing and because we're going to get them a sponsor. All right. Number three. What is a DIY nightmare story? So uh, this is not a DIY one, but I did see you originally. So when, when I prepped, you said, or, co or contract. Are you ready? Yeah, you can do that. It just so I'm going to tell you. Don't worry, I'm going to start this, cringing and squinging. This, well, this is a this is a uh, this is a brewery, and they had an architect that drew a brewery wall, sixty feet of brewery wall, and didn't pull any power through the wall for sixty feet. So they were not happy about that uh, and had to go back and get that fixed. Is that bad? That's bad. <laughs> oh my god, that's beyond bad. That's all. So Jason, you started out the episode talking about, I said, Hey, who do you look for? I look for guys who actually know what they're talking about their industry. So this architect clearly had no flippant idea what in the hell he was doing, but I bet it looked really good. <laughs> That's clear. Jason, you dropped some gold nuggets for us. We really appreciate it. Of course, 
Al and I love drinking beer, but and so we want to talk more about beer, but you brought so much to the table about what a banker can do for anybody trying to go into business, period. I know you're you're focused on the craft brewing business, but you dropped some real gold nuggets. If you think you want to go out there and start a business, you better have your character, your capacity. Your, your bankers will tell you, man, they call them the five C's and they'll come after it. And he, he knew what those were. And he was talking about them earlier on, but we, we got a chance to talk about this. So now, because you're specialized in the craft brewing business. I was just going to say one, one little nugget for me is a, a banker is not an obstacle. It's not a means to an end. The right banker is a partner in your business. And I would say, uh, like I said, I got a chance to meet Jason doing a podcast somewhere else years ago. And I've followed and stayed in contact with him. And uh, this dude definitely is a, he's a partner. You can tell, I mean, somebody who's looking out for people and trying to figure out a way to get them to a yes or get them to the right answer. Number one. So with that lead in and that big old bump up, how do we find you? Tell, tell everybody how they can find you. Yeah. So as uncreative as a banker is, uh, the social medias that I'm on are both Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, and so my LinkedIn is my most active, you know, I'm trying to post videos I'm, and they're little small digestible videos um, that I am uh, putting out there um, and I am trying to just put education out there, right? So whatever I can do to try and help people, uh, you know, with, with businesses. And so I do a lot of short interviews with, um, you know, brewery owners and um, I'm going to be posting about one of our breweries in Asheville that is doing a hot dog eating contest coming up July 20th. And so sometimes it's funny stuff that I post and sometimes it's pretty serious stuff that I put together. Uh, but you can find me on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, you can either, you know, just find me Jason Sleeman or if you type in brewery banker, uh, that's my like little specialization at the end of my LinkedIn uh, that you can find. That's going to be his moniker for now. But after I get done with it, we're going to have it all over the place. <laughs> Ball bust and brewery banker. It's I mean, going to be explicit. We, yeah, actually, I'm probably going to make you explicit. Jason, th thank you so much for coming on and sharing your experiences with us on the Small Business Safari. So we're going to go ahead and sign off. And then again, people, we are out there and we're slogging. We're making it happen. You're out there solving problems every day. You're going up that mountaintop and trying to get to that point of success you think you want to get to. And when you get there, you probably need to go a little bit further because success is different for all of us. Keep going up that mountain and make it a great day. Cheers. Later. <laughs>